about yeah, 40, 45 minutes of questions. So um, if you can keep your questions succinct um, and keep your questions questions, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, has the, the change in the agricultural system, I mean, is there a noticeable shift, I guess, in like the proportion of Cuba's population that's now involved in the agricultural sector? Has it sort of mean that people have maybe moved away from other I guess jobs or um, professions or whatever to become involved in the agricultural sector? Have you needed to sort of increase that level of people to run the new system? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. And <laughs> what do you think? Should we work like a group of questions or one by one? One by one. Okay. We, we have to say that this, this, this was a process, no? And, and, and at some point, when you start facing a situation that basically there is no food, totally independently of what you study, what you want to do, what you are, what you work, you need to find some time to grow things, because otherwise you don't need it. And that was the situation that, that started in, in the early 90s. Uh, you, you can have an excellent work. I, I saw PhDs or professors in the university going by, by uh, uh, surgeons with gardens and, and, and they have this uh, this idea it, it, it was a, a moment that everybody had to do it and as soon as, as, soon as, as, as the things started to improve a little bit or that the quality of the production started, <coughs> quality and quantity like the soil gets better and, and things like that there was a process that we call of concentration like less people, but more production, more quality of the production. So the people that uh, kept doing that, it was because they gained social recognition, they make money, and they like it. And I, uh, for, them, for some people that there was, we call it the q and case, especially in the case of urban agriculture, no? Uh, say, okay, it's less community oriented and things like that. No, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a process when like the, the quality of what happens, the, the agriculture as an activity is integrating to the urban context. Right now, no, like 10 years uh, afterwards, even more, uh, the urban agricultural system uh, fulfill half of the vegetable needs of a population of 2.2 million people. And so as a system for urban agriculture, for example, uh, the, the, the surface of Havana City, that is a province, uh, the whole city, everything that is practiced in the whole city is considered urban agriculture. And there is a, like a belt of five kilometers around the capital cities of the province, the provincial capitals, and two kilometers in smaller towns. So this is one thing. And of course, they, they were uh, like a, a, many people that they came back to the to the countryside or uh, on different schemes of production where people receive like 30, uh, 13 hectares, for example, to work <coughs> or arrangement, okay, this is a mango plantation. Uh, the mango belongs to the government, but everything that you can grow under the mango tree is yours. And that's an excellent thing. <laughs> so uh, that's the idea. But we have to take in account, and I think that this is very important because that can be applied to the southern part of the states and that slavery in Cuba was abolished in 1882. So a, a lot of people associate like the agriculture and the life in the countryside with poverty, with slavery, with disease, with misery, with illiteracy. Uh, because we were not a land of farmers. We were, it was a land of plantation with landlords, with American companies. And, and so that, that explained that at some point, even when we were able to transform towards organic farming more thousands of hectare, hectares than any other country in the world, and none of them are certified right now because the goal is to feed the people, not to market orient uh, things. No? So I can tell you right now that urban agriculture employs 150,000 Cubans right now. And they make 
four or five minimum wage a month. And they don't have to spend any food because they have food. <laughs> but there are many things, many things that are happening. Yes? I want some population growth. I'm going to bring the uh, mic just so that everyone can hear. What's the population growth rate in Q2? And how many people can it? We're not growing. Uh, 0 0.7 uh, children per woman. So we have a first world country numbers. And nobody wants to go there to live. We don't have immigration. No growth. No growth at all. But at the same time, we are 11 million people in 110,000 square kilometers. So our density of population is 100 people per square kilometer. We can't afford to do what people do here in New Zealand. I'm telling you. Another question? Yeah, I'll come up to you. Coming from the Green Revolution. Can you talk into that so we can all hear? Coming from the Green Revolution, uh, where did you find uh, non hybrid seeds in, in the special years? And then what's your processes to keep seeds at the moment, especially uh, Brassica? Okay, uh, the seeds was, is one of the main problems that we have to face if you really want to have like, an independent form of agriculture. And in the very beginning, uh, this were a big thing, a big problem. In fact, like the conventional agricultural system in the country, all the worst quality of seeds, they were the ones that they were given for like the urban agriculture uh, and uh, for the, these alternative solutions. Fortunately, in Cuba, there are more than 40 research centers uh, for agriculture. So there is one center for like vegetables, for tropical varieties and, and, and things like that. And, and the idea of, the, of this hybrid, because we are not connected with the big agro-business in the world, you know, like there is an office of fire, but they don't sell anything, no? And so it was necessary first to try to locate for very old varieties that they were lost in the middle of the mountains, and or like maybe a people with 80 years old. I remember the case that people that are descendants of Japanese, that they, that they have these vegetables that nobody eats, no? or descendants of Cantonese people, uh, that they were the ones that keep the tra kept the traditions alive. And everybody, it doesn't matter if you went to the university, you, you, you need to learn from all people. Yeah. And at the same time, they're specialization in the sense that there are farms whose main goal, the mandate, is to produce seeds. It's not to produce food or anything, just seeds for that. Still, I have to, to say you know, that the seeds that we need for urban agriculture or for, for permaculture, they are not in the market. We need seeds that they don't ripe at all at the same time. We need seeds that <coughs> produce tomatoes that are not baseball balls. <laughs> so the, the selection has to work in a totally different way. And this is a very long process because the, the sad news is that uh, the diversity on the, on the varieties was so huge because we adapted to live in different regions. And there, there were 7,000 varieties of beans, thousands of varieties. But right now, we're eating seven cereals. And how many commercial varieties are? 10 or something like that. They don't have what we need. And when they have it, it's locked in the German Plus Bank, and they're not giving to nobody. Because they just want to patent their genes, you know. <laughs>